Good day, grade 11. Welcome to this next lesson on um, atomic modeling and bonding. In this lesson, we're going to mainly be talking about bonding. We started with atomic model in the last lesson. Um, I apologize profusely if you guys came here expecting um, analytical geometry. There was a little bit of confusion, um, I think, um, with one of the, I don't know what out, went out. But anyway, today is Thursday and Thursday is the science day. Okay, so let's get started. We were talking about covalent bonding in our last lesson then when I spoke to you. And remember that covalent bonding is what? Covalent bonding, covalent bonding is what? It is the sharing of electrons. It is the sharing of electrons. Sharing. Whereas ionic bonding, what happens when you have ionic bonding is a transfer of electrons. And I'm not even going to mention metallic bonding. Okay, I am. But I'm going to transfer of electrons because metallic bonding occurs within metals. So it's pretty obvious. I guess it's transfer of electrons. Okay, so now in this lesson, we're going to talk specifically about covalent bonding, which is the sharing of electrons. So we're going to show you in a couple of examples how things bond, okay, and we're going to show you how we use the periodic table and Lewis structures. Remember Lewis structures are your Lewis, your dot, dot and cross diagrams. How we're going to use the Lewis structures and the dot and cross diagrams to show you how things bond. Okay, so first of all, what we need to do um, first thing we need to do is we need to determine the electron configuration for each of the bonding atoms. So what we need to do is find the first. So here is hydrogen and here is chlorine, right? So do you agree that hydrogen's in group one? And if it's in group one, it's got one valence electron. Okay, one valence electron. Um, chlorine is in group seven which means it's got what? It's got seven valence electrons. Okay, so the next thing, so what we're going to do is first draw this electron configuration. So let me just get a different color pen out. So we're going to draw hydrogen, and I'm going to do a dot for hydrogen or a circle. Okay, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you show that they're different. And chlorine um, has got, chlorine's got, that's it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Next it says determine how many of the electrons are paired and unpaired. So do you agree that hydrogen's got just one unpaired electron? Okay, hydrogen has got one unpaired electron. Chlorine has got one unpaired and it's got three other pairs. Okay, three pairs, three pairs, okay. And then what you need to do is work out how the electrons are shared. Okay, well, hydrogen and chlorine are pretty obvious because hydrogen is in um, row one, okay? But you guys don't say rows. What do we say? We say periods. And what's special about period one is that there are only two electrons in this outer energy shell. So in other words, to become a noble gas, hyd hydrogen just wants to gain one electron, okay? Chlorine is in group seven. It needs eight electrons in total in its outer energy shell to become noble. And it's got space for one. So do you see that what's gonna happen is the hydrogen's electron is gonna go share this orbital with this chlorine electron, okay? So we end up with this. We end up with hydrogen having one electron in its orbital. It then joins up with the chlorine. Chlorine's got this beautiful, and do you see this almost identical to what I've just drawn? We, I just didn't draw the circle around it. Okay, so it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, and the seventh one over there. Okay, and then what happens is they share. So you end up with one shared pair of electrons. Okay, so how do, and how would we write this? We'd write this as H, CL. Do you agree? HCl. Okay, now let's talk about covalent bonding of multiple bonds. Multiple bonds. So it says, how do nitrogen and hydrogen bond to form the molecule of ammonia? Now, guys, let's get real. In the exams, they're not going to say to you, how do nitrogen and hydrogen bond to form the molecule of ammonia? What's generally going to happen is they're going to say, use the, use the, 
Lewis starts structure to show the bonding of ammonia. Okay, so first of all, hydrogen. Again, hydrogen in the group one, so it's got a one valence electron. Nitrogen is in group five, so it's going to have five valence electrons. Five valence electrons, okay? So, give the electron configuration. Hydrogen is pretty easy. It is one. <laughs> okay, right? Nitrogen. Now, listen to me, by the way. The way that I draw this is always, except for carbon, and we'll talk about carbon in a while. A little while. You go one, two. That's for the first S energy level. Okay, the first energy level, which is your 2s orbital. Okay, so you go one, two, and then you start filling up. Okay, so you go three, four, five. Okay, so remember what do we want? We want actually to have eight electrons in this outer energy level. So sorry, we've given that. We've given the number of valence electrons. Now it says work out how many of the electrons are shared. Do you see that there is a gap? Hang on over here. There is a gap over here. And there's a gap over here. So we could fill in a hydrogen over here, a hydrogen over there, and a hydrogen over there. And that's exactly what happens here. You get three hydrogen atoms, join up with one nitrogen, and they fill these orbitals. So yeah, you've got one, there you've got another shared pair, and there's, so this one's gonna have three shared pairs of electrons. Get okay, three shared pairs of electrons. One, two, three. Okay, everybody happy with that? Okay, now let's move on. Um, it says, how do oxygen atoms bond to form a diatomic molecule? Okay, so again, we need to see now, we're saying oxygen forms a diatomic molecule. So just before we do anything else, what is a diatomic molecule? Diatomic molecule is an atom that bonds with itself. Di means two. And atomic is two atoms. And it's two atoms of the same type. And there are a couple of, just before I carry on with oxygen atoms, I just want to remind you guys that there are a couple of atoms that naturally occur in nature as diatomic molecules. They are hydrogen, and then they are um, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Okay, and all the halogens actually, it's N, it works like a seven. It's the slot here. There. Okay, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, acetine. Those are the atoms on the periodic table, elements on the periodic table that naturally form diatomic molecules. So let's talk a little bit about oxygen. Oxygen is in group what? Oxygen is in group six. Six. Okay. So do you agree that it's got six valence electrons? So if I had to draw it out using its the Lewis diagrams. It's O and it's one, two, and then it's three, four, five, six. So do you see that there is a space, space over here and a space over here. So there's a possibility of two shared pairs of electrons okay but let's say that my container only had oxygen atoms in it and do you agree that there'd be another oxygen atom i don't know why it's so big let me just fix that erase it okay let's do this another oxygen atom which is more or less the same size but it's got the same number of shared paired electrons but it might be oriented slightly differently so let's say it's one two three, four, five, six. Okay, so do you see it has a space over here and a space over here. So what could happen is that these two could actually join up, okay? They could actually move to actually join up. So let me show you how this works, okay? So let's just draw this one first. So we could end up with the oxygen, which is one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then this other little blue oxygen atom comes along and it fills up. It goes one, two, there's my oxygen, 
three, four, five, and six. And again, I apologize that they're not the same size. So do you see that they've got two shared pairs of electrons? Now, what have I done here that I don't want you guys to do in your diagrams? What have I done? Do you see that I've done crosses for the red oxygen and crosses for the blue oxygen? Now, guys, that's fine if you're using different colors, but most times in the exams, you guys are going to be using one color and you really need to be able to show which of these electrons come from which um, molecule atom. So in my case, it's pretty obvious because I've got different colors. So then obviously this one comes from the blue atom and this one comes from the blue atom and that from the red and that from the red. Cool. That is cool. However, if you're writing a test at school and you happen to be writing in a pencil or you've got one blue pen, you actually need to show which of the electrons belong to what. So what you need to do is you actually need to go one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then the next one that you draw has to be a different thing. It can't be crosses, which is why they call it the dot cross diagram method, okay? So you draw your other oxygen and you go one, two, three, four, five, six. There you go. And how would you write this? You write it as O2. The diatomic molecule is O2. And note also that this is a linear shape. Linear shape. Okay, so an oxygen molecule, diatomic oxygen molecule is actually linear in shape. Okay, now let's talk about carbon and fluorine. Okay, and there's a reason I wanted to choose carbon. It's a very important reason, so we're going to go through it nice and slowly. Okay, so do you see that carbon is in group four? Okay, carbon's in group four and fluorine's in group seven. Okay. So do you agree that means there's four valence electrons in carbon and seven valence electrons in fluorine? So now we need to draw these using our electron structure. But now carbon is very special. Carbon likes to get excited when it's bonding. Okay, it likes to get very excited when it's bonding. So what happens is, and I'm just going to show you, if we had to draw an F bar diagram for the number of electrons in carbon, do you agree it would be... 1 is 2, and again it would be up, down, and then it would be 2 is 2, up, down, and then 2p, and then we do this, 1, 2, oh, that's not going to be nearly enough space, hang on a minute, okay, okay, so it goes 2p, I did it again, never mind. And this is in the fourth group. So it's one, two, three, four. Okay. So that is normal, what that normally looks like with carbon. Okay, this is a normal structure of carbon if it's not bonded. But when carbon bonds, one of the electrons in this orbital get excited. Okay. And when they get excited, they jump. Oh, When they get excited, okay, when they get excited, they jump up. They get enough energy. Excitation in with chemistry is with respect to energy. Okay, so it gets excited, it has extra energy, and they jump up and they go over there. So now, do you see that we now have got four orbitals that are free, four electrons to take place? The way that we draw carbon is one, two, three, so every other atom, if we drew carbon in like every other atom, we'd go one, two, three, four. Okay, no. Okay, with carbon, carbon is very special because it's got that one electron that jumps up to there. It means that there is an extra space for electrons to be taken up, but that means that we draw it like this. Okay, now fluorine, remember, is in group seven, so that means it's got seven valence electrons. So fluorine is pretty normal and boring. If you think of it that way, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So you can see that there is a space over here. You can see there's a space there. Oh my hat. 
Okay, there's a space there. Sorry, I've got a new digital pen and pad, and I think I keep pressing the thing on the pen that makes it go to the next page. I'll fix that for next time. Okay, so that there is a space. Carbon has a space over here and over here and over here and over yeah. So obviously the fluorine can fit in there. So if we have to draw it like that, we'd go carbon and just draw it a little bit bigger to make it easier for ourselves. Okay. And then we need to draw in the fluorine. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So obviously then do you agree there's a space over here? So we could end up with the fluorine over here. And then it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ditto fluorine over here. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And finally fluorine over here, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There you go. And this is called carbon tetra fluoride carbon tetrafluoride carbon because it's the main it's the central atom tetra because there are four fluorines and fluoride okay now let's talk about the properties of covalent compounds First of all, melting and boiling points of covalent compounds are smaller than those of ionic compounds. Remember that your ionic compounds is a transfer of electrons, okay? And the transfer of electrons actually takes up more energy, which means that the melting and boiling points of covalent compounds is smaller than the, those of ionic compounds because it's actually slightly easier to break up the comp covalent compounds. They're also more flexible than our ionic compounds, which makes sense. Because the molecules in the covalent compounds are able to move around to some extent. Okay, they might move around a bit. Whereas the ionic um, elements, I mean, atoms in ionic compounds and elements tend to be in strict, in strict rigid spaces. Okay, remember the network lattice. Okay, so for example, and a typical example of a covalent compound is graphite. Now I've got a picture here of an HP pencil. Now I know we talk about having lead pencils and I don't know, some of you may even have been told, oh, you must be careful about that lead because you can get lead poisoning if someone sticks, I know what it's like at school. If someone ends up with a part of the pencil point in your skin or under your skin, everybody goes, oh, you're gonna get lead poisoning. You can't because that is graphite. Graphite is just pure carbon, pure, pure carbon. Okay, so no, you can't get lead poisoning from the pencil point being under your skin. Covalent compounds are not very soluble in water. And the part of the reason for that is for the fact that they have a different structure. In other words, Water tends to be polar molecule, whereas your covalent compounds not so much, so therefore they're not very soluble. But that does mean that we can use a very typical usage of covalent compounds and is plastics, okay? So, and I'm not just talking about the horrible plastic bags that we get at the shopping, any plastic. So your cell phone cover, your, um, let me think, your cell phone cover, your um, Tupperware that you get your lunch in from, from home that your mom packs for you, um, your, what else, the wires around your, your, your cables on your computer, those are all plastics, okay? Also, they do not conduct electricity when dissolved in water. And there's a reason for this, okay? When you have um ionic compounds ionic compounds let's say we've got nacl okay nacl breaks up into na plus plus cl minus okay so that's ionic and that's when it's dissolved into water so it's got positive ions and negative chloride ions for electricity to be transferred in a liquid you need there to be free ions okay so you need free ions Okay, but covalent bonds or covalent compounds don't give off free ions because there's no transfer in electrons. So therefore they don't form ions at all and therefore they cannot dissolve, cannot conduct electricity. 
Okay, so for example, iodine, which is a pure diatomic molecule and therefore is a covalent compound, does not conduct electricity. Right, now we're going to be talking about dative covalent bonds. So the definition of a dative covalent bond, okay. So far, we've spoken about, just before we talk about the definition, I want to talk about um, covalent bonding again. Remember that covalent bonding is this pure sharing of electrons, okay? Pure sharing of electrons. So dates of covalent bonds are bonds where there's a sharing of electrons, but it's coming from one of the atoms, okay? So an example would be, let's say for example, you've got a friend or a buddy that comes to stay with you and he goes, Oh, you know, I really have a problem. My flat's been repainted. I've got nowhere to stay. Can I please crash on your couch for a couple of days? Okay. The answer to that would be yes. Okay. <laughs> Depending on your friend. Okay. But that is an example of a dative covalent bond. You're not giving them a room. They're not sharing the rent. They're not doing anything for you. There is no sharing happening all that's happening is that person is crashing on your couch very temporarily okay so it says the definition is this type of bond is a description of covalent bonding that occurs between two atoms in which both electrons shared in the bond come from the same atom okay and it's also called coordinate covalent bonding coordinate covalent bonding so let's say for example you've got ammonia Okay, ammonia has got nitrogen, it's got hydrogen that's shared paired electron, shared paired electron, shared paired electron. Okay, so that's what it's got there. Okay, now the thing is that do you see over here there's this unshared pair of electrons? Unshared pair of electrons. Okay. That's the couch, if you want to think of it. Okay. Here comes a hydrogen ion. Okay. He's lost his electron. Okay. See, he has nothing to offer to the relationship. Okay. He has nothing to offer ammonia. So what happens is he comes along and he shares both these electrons. He actually sits over here. Okay. By doing that, do you agree that he's now made this ammonia have an extra hydrogen because of the hydrogen plus here? Yeah? He's got an extra proton. So it makes this whole thing a positive ion. Okay, it's now a positive ion. And this is ammonium. So this is ammonia. This adds a hydrogen and you get ammonium. And this explains also why ammonium is so reactive in reactions because ammonium is just waiting to get rid of that hydrogen. It's a very temporary situation where the hydrogen is sitting on the ammonium ion, okay? Very temporary and it requires energy to keep it there. So now let's talk about molecular shapes. There are a couple of reasons why molecular shapes are important. And I know these sections are terrible. I know that the molecular shape section is terrible because unfortunately you've got to study a bit, okay? But if you understand that molecular shapes are very, very important, then maybe it makes it worthwhile, okay? <laughs> because your molecular shape is important in determining how the molecule interacts and reacts with other molecules. Okay, so for example, we know that oxygen is a diatomic molecule which is linear. Okay, that's what an oxygen molecule looks like, sort of. Whereas water, H2O, is not linear at all, it's polar covalent and it's got a little hydrogen and a little hydrogen sticking out and it's got the big oxygen in the middle. So do you agree that they've got totally different shapes? Okay, and because they've got totally different shapes, they're actually, never mind the fact that they've got different atoms on them as well, they're going to have different properties. Okay, so molecular shape is important in determining how the molecule interacts and reacts with other molecules. It also influences the boiling point and melting point of the molecules because if the 
shapes are such that the molecules keep repelling each other or not being able to come near each other, then obviously it's going to affect how easy it is to boil those uh, the, that con um, that solution or that liquid and get it to a point where there is it's changing all the way from a liquid to a gas. Okay, so it does influence the boiling point and melting point. Right, so let's talk about VESPER, V-S-E-P-R, which stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory. So again, Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory. Okay, now let's just talk about that. Valence is your outer shell, so valence shell. So we're saying in the valence shell, the outermost shell, around your core, your nucleus, okay, there are electrons that should be working together, but in fact are repelling each other, okay, they're repelling each other, and that is the valence shell electron pair repulsion, okay. So what the theory states is that a valence electron pairs in a molecule will arrange themselves around a central atom or atoms of the molecule so that the repulsion between the negative charges is as small as possible. Okay, so let's go through it again. What we're saying is that the valence electrons are going to space themselves around the atom so as not to repel each other. Okay, that's really what it's saying. Um, or to make the repulsion as small as possible. Okay, so another way you can say it is, well, just like I said, the valence electron pairs arrange themselves so they are as far apart as they can be. So let's talk about how you go about determining molecular shape. In order to do this, you need to follow these steps, and this is obviously for covalent molecules because we're talking only about covalent molecules now. Step one, you draw a molecule using the Lewis diagrams. Cooper notation doesn't really help us. If you think about it this way, if I drew a, a Cooper notation for oxygen, I, I mean for water, do you agree that I could write this as O, H, H? Okay, fine. But if I drew the Lewis structure for this, it would be oxygen is in group six. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And then do you agree that there is a space at the bottom over here for a hydrogen and there's a space over here for a hydrogen? So do you see this here? It doesn't show me at all the shape, whereas here we can see that this is obviously angular, okay? It's, it might look like it's 90 degrees and that's fair enough, but the point is it's definitely not a linear molecule. Okay, it says make sure that you draw all the valence electrons around the molecule's central atom, which we did. Then you count the number of electron pairs around the central atom. So in this case, it would be two shared pairs of electrons, where am I? two shared pairs of electrons and two unpaired and shared pairs of electrons. I always get this words wrong. And shared pairs of electrons. Okay, so then you do determine the basic geometry using the table. So let's talk about this table. This is the number of bonding electron pairs. Okay, so if there are zero, one or two bonding electron pairs, then we and, and linear number of, lin, of lone pairs is linear, a zero, then we end up with a linear molecule and the general formula for that is AX or AX2 okay that makes sense right because either you have two molecules or you could have AX2 an example of AX2 um, just to give you an idea would be carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide works like this you go carbon and the carbon goes one two three four Carbon dioxide is one carbon and two oxygens, Xi being two. So you could have another oxygen here and it'd be one, two, I'm doing it again, one, two, and then it goes oxygen. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And similarly, there'll be another oxygen here saying one, two, and then you got three, four, five, six. So we had one, two, three. Yeah, I drew too many on the bottom one. Oh, and it's gone. Okay, let me do it again. Oxygen is um, one, two, uh, three, four, five, six. Okay, and then you've got carbon dioxide. 
So let's just draw in the carbon dioxide. So it'd be carbon dioxide would be a C, yes, it's carbon, and you got zero and you got zero. And then I'm going to draw over my formula. It's fine, it's not a big deal. So it's going to be over here, it's going to be neither oxygen. Okay, and just to hang on, just let me finish. Here is the other four, the other two electrons of your carbon. And then we go one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can see it's a linear molecule. There it is. So even though it is made up of three atoms, it can be a linear molecule. You just have to look at how the Lewis structure works. Okay. So if there is two bonding pairs and the number of lone pairs is two as well, then it's bent or angular. Okay, so an example of this would be ox water. So if you've got water, you've got oxygen, and you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and then you've got hydrogen, which is sitting over here. And yeah, okay. So do you agree it's got two electron pairs? two electron pairs, bonding pairs, that would be these two, and it's got two lone pairs, which would be these two, and it ends up being angular or bent, so it ends up dush, dush, okay, and there's the general formula, AX2, E2, etc., so three becomes trigonal pena, three trigonal etc., etc., cetera, et cetera. so you need to learn how to use this table. Unfortunately, this table is not available on your formula sheet, so you have to learn it. But if you do enough examples, it becomes pretty second, much second nature as to how you get the molecule shapes. Okay, so common molecule shapes. First of all, let's look at them over here. Yes, this is how they would look if they were drawn, drawn using Cooper notation. Remember what I said to you is that if it does a little um, thing with it looks like a zebra crossing but it's a zebra crossing band that looks like this, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, or even straight across, then it means that it's going into the page. Okay, so this is drawing three dimensionally. So A is there, X is to the left, and this X over here is going into the page, and this X is coming out of the page. So in other words, it's got three different angles. This one over here, which is coming out of the page, that one going down and into the page, and this one going across the page. Okay, so we've got bent or angular, trigonal pyramidal, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral. I haven't ever really heard us using that one. Okay, now let's have a look at them if they were drawn as um, shapes. Okay, so a linear can either be two atoms like I have shown you, or it can be linear like I showed you with a carbon, double bonded oxygen, double bonded oxygen. Okay, could be trigonal planar, which means that all three atoms or whatever are joined together in the same plane. Bent or angular is, for example, an ex of water. I mean, not water. Yes, water. Tetrahedral. I'm thinking methane, trigonal planar, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral. Okay, so now let's do an example. Okay, so we want to determine the shape of BCl2. So the first thing that we do is draw the molecule using the Lewis diagram. So beryllium, if you get your periodic table out, and guys, what did I say? I said that if you're doing any type of science, you need to have your formula sheets and your periodic table with you. Admittedly, we don't really use our periodic table when we're doing physics, but we do need it when we're doing a paper two chemistry. So you guys should always, always have your periodic table out and your formula sheet, okay, as well as a calculator. So it says determine the shape of the molecule BeCl2. Well, Be is in group two, okay. Chlorine is in group, what is it, group seven, okay. So beryllium has got two valence electrons and chlorine's got seven. So if you look at it, we can draw the molecules as each such, and then you'll notice that beryllium is the central atom. And then you need to draw it, okay? So we draw beryllium as one, two, okay? In other words, they've drawn it as one, two, 
okay and then they can draw chlorine over here and chlorine over here but this is quite an interesting one because the fact is that it actually ends up being a linear molecule and there's a reason okay so let's just skip that for a minute and talk about the other steps we're going to count the number of electron pairs around the central atom so electron pairs we've got two electron pairs um let me see. There are two types of electron pairs. Okay, there is three. Um, okay, no, around the beryllium atom. Sorry, around the central beryllium atom. So around around the central beryllium atom, do you agree there's only two unshared pairs of electrons? Unshared pair. Okay, unshared. So We've got two shared pairs and no unshared pairs of electrons. Where is the chlorine? We've got one, two, three, three unshared and one shared. Whereas, yeah, again, chlorine's got three unshared and one shared. But beryllium, what does beryllium have? It has two shared, shared pairs of electrons, of electrons. Okay, so there are two electron pairs. Now, step three, we need to determine the basic geometry of the molecule. So there are two electron pairs and there are no lone pairs around the central atom. So you've got two electron pairs, no lone atoms. So BeCl2 has got the formula Ax2. So it's got this formula Ax2, okay, BeCl2. So if it's got that formula, then it should be linear. So let's have a look and we see that the shape is linear. There you go. Okay, let's move on to another example. It says determine the shape of BF3. So again, we're going to draw the molecule using a diagram. And boron again is in group three, three, and fluorine is in group seven. So we draw boron with one, two, three. And then we start filling in because we've got fluorine and remember fluorine's in group seven so it's going to have seven valence electrons so it goes one two three four five six seven and you end up with the space over there similarly over here and similarly over here okay so what we're saying is that boron joins up with fluorine in the ratio of bf3 the central atom is boron now it says count the number of electron pairs around the central atom. So do you see that boron has three shared pairs of electrons? It's got three electron pairs or three shared pairs of electrons. Okay. Now, now we need to determine the basic geometry of the molecule. So they've been very nice to us, but in this, we've we written this out where we actually have a pretty, pretty picture, but a better than my drawing, okay? We see that there are three electron pairs and no lone pairs around the atom. There's nothing there, okay? So therefore, the formula is AX3. There is the formula AX3. So if that's the case, it is going to be trigonal planar. Ta -da! So there you can see how you can use a general formula or the number of bonding pairs and lone pairs to work out your shape if you know this table. And this table isn't on the formula sheet, guys. If you're lucky, your teacher might give you the table, but chances are that you're not going to be that lucky. So you need to, need to, need to go and study it. Okay, so there's trigonal planar. Let's try ammonia. Again, we're going to draw the Lewis structure. So ammonia, nitrogen is in group five and hydrogen is obviously in group one. So nitrogen is going to have one. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Right, so that's five. Now, we count the number of electron shared electron pairs around the central atom. So do you agree we've got one, two, three shared pairs, three shared pairs? shared pairs and we've got one unshared pair one unshared pair or we also call it a lone pair which is this up here okay so it says there are four electron pairs but admittedly three of them are shared and one is unshared so now we can determine the basic geometry there are three bonding electron pairs and one lone pair so therefore the molecule is ax3e okay it's x standing for the bonding pair 
pairs and the E standing for the lone pair. So again, we look at our table, we see it's AX3E, it's that one there. So therefore, again, it needs to be trigonal pyramidal, trigonal pyramidal, okay. And that grade 10s is, I mean grade 11s, is as far as I want to go with you guys today. I think we did very well. Um, I would really suggest that you guys make sure that you can do these shapes and learn this table because the chances are they're not going to give you the table, okay? Um, or just work it out from your diagrams, learn how to work it out from your diagrams. But I must admit they're only really, what is it, linear, angular, trigonal planar, trigonal pyramidal, um, tetrahedral, Okay, so there's all those. There are six shapes. So if you can learn those six shapes and learn to identify them, then you'll be sorted for this whole shape and the VACP, R theory, et cetera, et cetera. All right, grade 11s, I hope that that helped you. Have a wonderful evening, and I will see you again on Tuesday. Cheers.